the bathtub. How is everyone doing tonight? Good to see you all here. It's a little warm in here, but that's all right. We got um, our, le our lessons to fan us. <laughs> so I'm Carrie Moreau. I'm your class administrator. And I have a couple quick announcements um, to bring to you this evening. Um, before we get started, Phoebe is going to come up here. She's our class treasurer. She's going to give us our class treasurer report. Thank you. Um, so here we go. We started the year January 1st with a balance of $25. Our total in class and online contributions for both January and February were $6,771, uh, which means we gave a contribution to our host church of $2,187.77 and contributed $4,583.23 to headquarters and maintained a balance of $25. Yeah. And part of those contributions were online. So remember, you can continue to give online. It's a wonderful way to, if you forget to bring it on class night. So there's something really cool happening soon. It has to do with technology. Some of you might be going womp, 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 because VSF.org might not be working the way that you want, but it's still very exciting times in VSF because we are light years ahead that we used to see just a few short years ago. So the VSF app is also getting an update. So you can find the VSF app on your device if you go to your app store and it is free. It has the logo of our VSF, the little Bible with the yellow behind it, you know, the white little logo. And you can search it by just typing in Bible Study Fellowship. So the app will soon receive some enhancements that integrate the app with the new mybsf.org. And you'll be able to log in using your mybsf.org credentials so that you can access your encrypted lesson answers across multiple devices. So right now, I use the BSF app. But that's the only place where I can see it is on my phone. But what this update is going to do is going to allow you that when you log in on your iPad, on your phone, on your computer, wherever it is that you're accessing the app, you will be able to see your lesson and your answers and also uh, be able to listen to the notes there and be able to watch the video lecture. So um, the VSF app is not the same as WordGo. That's also one of the SS um, apps, but they're totally different. So um, I know it's kind of hard to keep up. I know it is for me at times, but um, if you are still having trouble with mybsf.org, please stop by um, directly behind this, this, in this hallway right here. There's a room, most of us walk by it, room 122. That's where the admin leaders, there's always an admin leader in that room. Please stop by that room, bring your device with you, and we will do what we can to get you connected, to take you through some of the steps. And if we can't do it in a quick two or three minutes when you stop by, we'll get your contact information and we'll reach out to you during the week and we'll work with you and do some help desk things over the phone and hopefully get you uh, where you want to go. Let's see, I think that's all the things I have tonight. Oh, you don't. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre, so much. Yes, I hope you guys are enjoying or at least uh, persevering through our new uh, website, the app, and um, it's all good stuff, and eventually it's going to be 100%. So, well, our scripture verse on this week that is for the school program, also on the notes, is in Matthew 21, 42. It says, Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is marvelous. He is everything. So as we sing this hymn, there is Lord Jesus. Let's stand up and let's worship him. Think about these words. Think about how wonderful that Jesus is the one that has uh, sovereign authority over you and all creation. There is Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, Thank you. 
Oh, Jesus, we are so thankful that you are beautiful and you love us beautifully. Thank you because contemplating your beauty, creating us a desire to surrender to you, and you deserve all surrender because you have all authority over all creation. And we want to learn more of that. So we ask you that in this lecture, you teach us about yourself. You teach us about your sovereign authority. Holy Spirit, quiet our minds from the business of the days and draw our hearts closer to you. May we hear your voice so we can know you and be fruitful servants of your kingdom. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So perhaps you have heard this one, this story. It's a story of this battleship plowing at the night through the rough foggy seas. And all of a sudden, uh, this battleship's radar indicates an object directly in its path. So the ship's, uh, the ship's captain sent a radio signal saying, we are on collision course. I advise you to change course 10 degrees north. A response crackles over the radio, negative. We advise you to change course 10 degrees south. The captain now sees this blinking light from the approaching object and perturbed, he, below, he, he bellows a, a reply. I'm a ship's captain. Change course 10 degrees north now. I am a seaman second class, come the reply. Advise that you change course 10 degrees south to avoid imminent collision. The captain is furious now. He blurs another command. This is a battleship. Change your course immediately. Back comes this calm reply. This is a lighthouse. <laughs> so the battleship changed course. So this reminds me that in this world, people love to exercise authority. Authority is valuable because it means independence and control, and we do like that, don't we? But because we are flawed people with limited and biased emotions and limited knowledge of facts, we simply cannot be perfect in our exercise of authority. Our sinful nature defaults us to a corrective use of authority that puts us in direct collision with God's sovereign authority. 
And that is the path of collision with God's wrath. Since Adam and Eve has sinned in the garden, every human being is born a sinner and destined to face judgment and consequently receive God's wrath. But God in his love and mercy sent his son Jesus Christ to save sinners. God sent Jesus as a savior and yet God sent Jesus with full authority as king and judge. Therefore, every person, every person's personal destiny is determined by their individual response to Jesus. And our pastor today confirms the truth that God will judge those who reject his son. Because Jesus has sovereign authority over all creation. So it is important to recognize and submit to Jesus' authority. So would you open your Bibles with me in Matthew chapter 21, and let's lean close and learn from him. And our first division is the sovereignty, the sovereign authority. Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 to 27. Throughout Matthew's record, we have been studying the escalating expressions of Jesus' undeniable authority over nature, over disease and demons, the authority to forgive sins, and even the authority over death. And in this passage, we learn about his sovereign authority to judge. Jesus is the ultimate authority over all creation. And this authority has been delegated by God the Father. So as we pick up on verse um, 18, Jesus and his disciples are returning uh, to Jerusalem. And Jesus was hungry, which is a sign of his humanity. And he saw a fig tree. Now, fig trees and figs were common staple food in Israel. It yielded um, a lot of fruit twice a year in the early spring and the early autumn. In this passage, it's this thing that is we are reading here is happening in early spring when the fig tree leaves should bud along with its fruit. So Jesus went out to get fruit, but he found none. And the leaf, so the leaf tree was deceiving. It promised fruit, but it didn't deliver. So in an expression of his sovereign authority, Jesus cursed the tree. And he said, may you never bear fruit again. And Matthew tells us that it withered immediately. Now, why Jesus cursed this fruitless tree? Jesus was not expressing anger or frustration. This was an acted out parable, an illustration of a visual aim of his sovereign authority to judge. Jesus was judging the spiritual barrenness of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. He was using the fig tree as a world picture. So the temple where they were going was the symbol of Israel's spirituality. But though it looked impressive at first glance, Israel's religious leader, leaders were putting forth a show of religion without hearts that were pliable to God. Its sacrifices and activities were hollow because they were not done unto God, but unto man's control and power and praise. So Israel, God's fig tree, which we hear so much in the Old Testament, there's so many passages in the Old Testament where God compared Israel to the fig tree. Um, Israel, the fig tree, was not fulfilling God's intended purposes. There was no spiritual fruit. This tree was barren. So first, when the disciples were amazed by what they had just witnessed, and they asked Jesus, how did, it, uh, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus redirected the question toward the purposeful answer. He didn't explain things about nature and all of that. No. Jesus explains that uh, he called uh, his disciples, uh, he used that moment for a teachable moment to call his disciples to fruitfulness. 
the kind of fruitfulness that comes because of expectant prayer and dependent faith. And that is the kind of fruitfulness God intended for his people. So he says in verse 21 to 22, truly I tell you, <clears throat> if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. So Jesus was not encouraging people to pray for extraordinary physical demonstration of power, like cursing an unfruitful tree or casting mountains into the sea. Jesus was teaching that in his name and with his authority that he delegated to the disciples, these disciples would preach the gospel and see mountains of unbelief and hardened human hearts become softened. They would see lives transformed. The big mountain of established man control religion would be thrown into the sea and God's kingdom be established instead. The command to have faith is not just teaching his disciples and us to pray for whatever we want or to what God and, and that God will answer our prayers if we have enough faith. No, it teaches us to pray that his kingdom come. Jesus' command to have faith teaches to humbly surrender to his authority, which impels us to be servants in advancing God's kingdom on earth and as it is in heaven. He teaches us to secure our faith in him and his coming kingdom. This promotes in us a God confidence more than a self confidence. And it leads us to pray for his purposes in our lives and not our own personal agendas. So Jesus' words in verses 21 and 22 are a powerful motivation for prayer, for prayer that puts him first. So Jesus then enters the temple, verses 23 to 27. He enters the temple courts, and while he is teaching, the chief priests and the elders came armed with loaded questions. Verse 23, they asked Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? What things do they mean? See, they have seen Jesus heal people. They have felt the palpable authority when he spoke. So more likely, they were referring to his recent cleansing of the temple, which had been a direct assault on their own authority in their home court. In their own twisted way, they were admitting indeed that Jesus had authority. Then they asked, and who gave you that authority? These were not questions of heart seeking for truth. It's so interesting because their questions, they should be the first ones to know. If you remember, the people have seen Jesus healing. Um, uh, and even a Roman soldier had acknowledged Jesus' authority. They had seen Jesus teaching on the Sermon at the Mountain, and they have acknowledged Jesus' authority. Rather, these men were not asking questions, seeking truth. These men loved their own power, but they saw Jesus as a threat. So in display, um, in a display of authority, Jesus returned with a question of his own. And he asked, and he says, I will ask you, um, I, I will also ask you one question. And if you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it came from? Was it from heaven or from human origin? Well, these religious leaders start to discuss among themselves. And now they were in a tough spot because if they claim John had acted on God's authority, then they would be, consi they would be considering authority they did, that they did not want to relinquish. And if they claim that John had acted on his own authority, now they fear the people 
and the insurrection that the people would come up with. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. They didn't want an answer to Jesus. They didn't want to, uh, an answer, uh, to answer Jesus' questions. What they wanted was to trap Jesus. These religious leaders only wanted truth that supported their own views and their own ideas and their own interests. These men chose to cling to their own sense of authority and continue to refuse to submit to Jesus' authority. They saw themselves as the way to God, not Jesus. Not so differently is in our world today. Despite overwhelming evidence of Jesus' undeniable authority, people, people refuse to give up their own sense of authority and autonomy to you, to Jesus. They want the blessings and goodness of God in their lives, but they refuse to surrender to Jesus. Jesus is all good until what Jesus teaches interferes with what they think about marriage. Jesus is all good until what Jesus teaches interferes with what they think about business. Jesus is all good until Jesus interferes about um, what they think uh, about uh, growing and, and achieving their goals and putting people first. There is a point at which in the face of continued rejection of truth, God moves on to the receptive. And only God knows that point. God is compassionate and merciful. And he offered these very men multitude of opportunities to turn to him. But they persistently reject him. And the result, uh, results of rejecting Jesus' authority are evident in how the fig tree withered at his command. But there is even another evidence of Jesus' authority as the religious leaders were silenced. They were silenced by Jesus' authority as Jesus went silent before them. See, they rejected Jesus. Consequently, they reject God in a fruitful life. So here's the principle and truth for us to ponder and to apply. Rejecting Jesus' authority, authority leads to fruitful, fruit, fruitful, fruitless life. Let's say that again. Rejecting Jesus' authority leads to fruitless life. We cannot please or even claim to know God if we reject his son. An outward show and a pious words and, and pious words cannot hide the reality of a barren human heart. These religious leaders rejecting our Jesus' rightful authority over their lives exposed their fruit, fruitlessness. All there were leaves, but close inspection clearly reveals there was no fruit. I can help to think how I passionately profess my commitment to Christ, and yet I can, I can put away too much effort and focus on my own thoughts and my own agenda. I think how often I am tempted to elevate my own thoughts, to think too much of myself and about myself and what I do. And in so many ways, like these religious leaders, I can foolishly love the little kingdoms over which I presume I have autonomy and authority and good control. How about you? How have you questioned Jesus' authority and refused to submit to it? But thanks be to Jesus' loving and persistent compassion, as we see in the next verses, because Jesus goes on to teach these parables to extend mercy to the unbelieving, but also as an act of judgment. That was the display of his righteous authority. This is our second division. Jesus' righteous authority. So Jesus teaches three parables about the kingdom that awaits the unbelieving. 
These parables reflect Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders. Each parable highlights severe judgment, but also offers an opportunity for repentance and belief. So in verses 28 to 32, Jesus taught that through the parable, Jesus taught to the parable of the two sets. And it goes like this, a father asked his sons to work in a vineyard. The first refused, but then repented and worked, right? The second son said he would work, but didn't. So the father in this parable represents God the father whose authority is rejected. So Jesus asked the question, which son did what his father wanted? The religious leaders answered, the first son. It was the one who did the work despite his initial refusal. Jesus responds with a shocking statement. He said that tax collectors who were hated by the Jews as traitors and prostitutes who were deemed a despicable sinner in their eyes would enter God's kingdom ahead of them. <clears throat> well, he said, Jesus said that to them. And Jesus said, you rejected John. Remember, I asked, I asked you about them, him. He called you to repent and you didn't. But these tax collectors and prostitutes, they repented and turned to God. You saw the same things, but you refused to repent. What a reversal. The despised people turned to Jesus while the esteemed religious leaders turned away from him. This message is not like the message of the cursed fig tree that was all leaf. Uh, this message is like the, the message of the cursed fig tree that was all leaves but had no fruit. Curse fell on the fruitlessness. God builds his kingdom with those who acknowledge their spiritual needness and turn to him. So in verses 20, uh, 33 to 46, in chapter 21, we're still there. Then Jesus commanded his leaders to listen to another parable. The weak tenants portrays the, the, the parable of people who reject, reject Jesus' authority by rejecting God's messenger and ultimately his son. So a landowner planted a vineyard surrounded by a wall and protected by a watchtower. He rented the vineyard to some farmers. At harvest time, the landowner sent servants to collect the portion of the harvest that was due to him. The tenant farmers uh, severely mistreated the uh, landowner's servants, even killing them. Finally, the landowner sent his own son, expecting that the tenant would respect him. Instead, the wicked and greedy tenants seized the son, threw him out, and killed him as well. So the message was clear. God has given Israel a prized possession of his revelation and many, many spiritual privileges. And through the ages, they refused and abused his messenger and prophets. And now they were getting ready to kill God's own son. And in verse 40, Jesus asked them a question. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with his tenants? And in a self-incriminating answer, the religious leaders say, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at a harvest time. Jesus went on to quote then Psalm 118, which says, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders reject had become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Next, Jesus' words declare an indictment on those who stood in his presence and yet continue to reject his authority. He says in verse 43 to 44, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. 
anyone on whom it falls can be crushed. With authority delegated to him by God, Jesus pronounced judgment. They had spurned and rejected God's grace by rejecting his son. So God's wrath would fall on them and deserve judgment. Now, the doctrine of God's wrath is not very popular among people, is it? People, even Christians, prefer to see God only as a God of love who accepts everyone without condition. But God's wrath, like everything he is and does, he stands in perfect balance with his entire character and nature. And while this concept stretches us, our desire should be to know God as he has declared himself to be. God loves everything, that in everything that is good and right, and he does that because he is holy. He hates everything that opposes what he loves, everything that is unholy. Now, we know that all people are infected with a sin nature and rightfully deserve God's wrath and his holy and just response towards sin. God hates sin, but God does not hate people. Theologians and Bible scholars see God's wrath as a secondary attribute of God, different than his qualities of love, holiness, justice, and righteousness. For example, 1 John 4 8 tells us that God is love. We do not believe in the same way that God is wrath. Rather, God's wrath is a holy response to something external to himself. God knew no one would be exempt of his wrath because we are all sinners. But God sent Jesus to save sinners, to rescue us from his wrath. In fact, he sacrificed his own son so that we do not have to experience his wrath. God responds to me in wrath because of my sin. And God responds to me in love because he is love, because of who he is. When I believe in God's wrath, I have a proper view of a holy God. I praise him for all that he is as righteous and sovereign judge. I recognize my sin and how God hates it. I acknowledge my need for my Savior, Jesus, and willingly submit to his righteous authority. I'm passionate about sharing this truth with others, about sharing the gospel with others. God's wrath is a serious matter. So in verses 1 to 14 of chapter 22, Jesus further intensified his sober warning to Israel's leaders with this next parable, the wedding banquet. A king who represented God the Father prepared a wedding banquet for his son, which is Jesus. The wedding banquet points to the celebration of entering a joyous relationship with Jesus. The invitation to come is offered now with a celebration that is going to be extended to all it throughout eternity. But the guests refused to attend. So the kings graciously, graciously sent a second invitation, and some refused with passive indifference, while others aggressively murdered the servants. The king then was rightfully enraged, and consequently, those who refused God's invitation and his his grace faced dire consequences. And then God invites not just Israel, but the whole world for salvation, to salvation. And God's invitation to salvation would be extended to all the ends of the earth. And those who respond, anyone who would respond to Jesus' gracious invitation, experience this present 
and eternal rejoicing and provision. One guest we hear in verse 11 arrive, arrive without wedding dress. And we women know all about that, don't we? The only way to enter this lavish wedding feast of the Lamb is to be clothed in the righteousness that Christ provides. No one can enter by their own merits because that would be like be clothed in filthy rags of flawed human righteousness. Jesus' righteousness is the only attire who allow us to enter the wedding feast and enjoy the banquet. So the man was cast out into the darkness because unbelief and refusal to come to Christ is a serious matter. So here's a principle for us. This is a truth. Jesus has authority to bring judgment against everyone who reject, rejects him as a savior. This lesson has delivered a stark and serious message because Jesus drew hard lines with eternal consequences. It's not a few good message, isn't it? The sense of authority and autonomy we think, we think we possess must be surrendered to the greater authority. Otherwise, we will head in deadly collision with Jesus' immovable authority. So what is God calling you to do with this sobering truth? In what ways might God be calling you to surrender to his authority over you and your life? God is calling each, of, each one of us to listen, to you, and to surrender to him in specific ways, in ways that matter. He's calling us to come to him humbly, to trust him for greater things and experience the fruit of active faith, fruit that will last throughout eternity. Jesus has the sovereign authority over us. He has that authority over all creation. He is calling us to submit to his immovable, immovable authority. So would you submit and change your course? Let's pray. Father, this is a heavy message. And yet, it is true. And your word says that your truth set us free. So I pray that you, Holy Spirit, we may make this, cause these words to land exactly what they should in our hearts, in our minds, and propel us to change. For the glory of your name, for the fruitfulness of your kingdom, we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Have a wonderful time in your group. See you there.